We have about 15 minutes, a little more, um, for questions. Um, and, and I'd also like to offer the opportunity if any of the three of you have questions for each other, just just signal, because I think there's quite a lot to, to debate about there. Raj, I see. Is it on? <laughs> use the informal and just use talk without. <clears throat> okay, I'm formal now. Um, good. Thank you very much. It's really exciting presentations, all three. Um, and a uh, very good introduction as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, I want to um, ask... Uh, about another couple of um, intersections, which I think could be really, really important for this and will be increasingly important. Um, this has been about informality and formality in the work uh, situation, but if you then compound it in terms of uh, informal settlements, you know, the kind of uh, slum dwellers and shack dwellers uh, international uh, agenda, uh, it becomes even more complicated because you might not just be vulnerable where you're working, but also where you're living, and that compounds it. And I wonder if the uh, panel have comments on that. Uh, secondly, um, whether you have comments on um, unpaid caring, uh, because that's a huge burden uh, on women and will increasingly become uh, more and more. Uh, I saw a statistic which was so big that I didn't believe it. And because I didn't believe it, I think I've forgotten it. But I think that by 2030, there are going to be another 100 million Indians who are over 65. Uh, and that uh, means a huge additional burden, uh, primarily for women, unless there's a, a vast change in terms of male behavior. Uh, and then, um, Ravi, a question to you. Uh, your typology, don't you also need a sixth category or, or uh, additional categories for the firms that are playing international hide-and-seek and not just national hide-and-seek? Thank you. What we're going to do, because the questions are coming, I will take you, the lady there, and then Santiago behind in the first um, round of three, and then I see Sam and I see Thank you. Yes, thank you for uh, these presentations. I'm particularly interested in um, the the study of Ravi and the presentation on um, these categories. And I was wondering if you took into account this, the intersection of this informal sector with actually informal employment, as uh, a lot of these um, a lot of enterprises can be uh, compliant for taxes and paying taxes, but hiring some workers formally and others uh, informally. Or another um, scenario we see a lot in the Middle East is uh, enterprises who oblige the, the workers before hiring them to under-declare their revenue so they pay less social security for them. Um, thank you. So, so thank you all three for, for very nice presentations. <clears throat> this is <clears throat> a question for Ravi on, on, on the very nice um, tax typology that you have. So the question here is, in many of these VAT regimes, the threshold says firms above the threshold are in the normal VAT regime and firms below the threshold have a special regime, a separate regime, single tax or, or fixed percentage of sales or something like that. And then my understanding, but, but uh, sort of what your, your opinion is, they segment firms because firms below their threshold cannot sell to firms above the threshold because debiting for the purposes of the VAT cannot occur. So should the facto really segment the economy into these firms can only buy intermediate inputs and sell intermediate to themselves, but, but the larger firms cannot buy intermediate inputs from the smaller firms that are below the threshold. <laughs> so changing the threshold then will leave the composition, will change the composition of informality, but will also have impact on firms depending on whether they want to sell to the larger firms or not as they debit or credit across the regimes. So, so I, I just thought we had some reactions to that. I'm going to take the fourth and fifth, fifth yeah, because some of these questions were very much directed at individuals, which is great. Thank you very much. Um, the 
Thanks. Uh, so, uh, per Ronos, uh, Swedish Development Agency, CEDA. Uh, well, thanks for good presentations. And uh, I would like to raise the issue of the political economy of the informal, uh, uh, of informal employment. I, the, the issue, why do firms not formalize? And there's uh, a lot has been said about why they dodge formalization, etc. But what about the other side? What about the incentives to prevent formalization? Government incentives, to, government and others incentives to prevent formalization, uh, because clearly the informal economy is a gold mine for rent extraction. You pointed out police, etc., uh, requesting bribes. So there's a lot of vested interest within. Uh, the, uh, w w within departments, governments, etc., uh, was <coughs> on, on that score. But there's the also there's also the insider outsider issue. I would think that formal firms and formal workers often have a dis have an incentive to keep others out uh, because it allows uh, segmentation of the labour market uh, seg uh, into those. Who have who who can have uh, good um, working conditions, um, uh, worker rights, higher wages, etc., and they they can do this because they can exploit those on the outside. So, have you looked at all in, into the issues of governments and other vested interests trying to uh, prevent informal firms from from formalizing? And Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Thank you very much. And your um, Sam first, and then the person sitting behind the lady in the stripes, and then we'll stop there and give them a round, and then I see you. Okay. Yes. Yes, Samuel Wangwe from uh, Tanzania. Report. Yes. Uh, this is a, a very interesting three presentations. They have convinced me that uh, informality is very diverse and very complex, uh, and I think this is a good starting point because then we cannot oversimplify it in the policy. Uh, but second, I think the discussion about uh, taxation is very common even in our countries. It's um, uh, one way of seeing it is actually uh, uh, scaring away the enterprise that formalize so that you can tax them. To formalize so you can pay tax. So it would sound like uh, formalization means paying tax then that's a, a message that go on the ground. Um, but uh, I would like to see it in terms of what uh, a number of you have demonstrated, the productivity uh, issue. Because they are informal, they cannot access resources, information, markets. They are limited, they are limited in that respect. Therefore, they remain uh, low productivity, low incomes, uh, uh, non decent in uh, jobs. So one, if one sees in terms of how to access resources, uh, then it seems, um, uh, as uh, has been shown in here, two main categories of uh, uh, challenges. One is how to make it easy for them to cross into formalization through the legal and regulatory uh, framework. Uh, but secondly, uh, how to ensure that uh, uh, they have access to resources, uh, proper premises, markets, uh, finance, uh, skills, all this, because they can't get access to this, they remain low productivity, low income, poverty. Thank you, Sam, very much. Yes, sir. You'll be in the next round, the person in front of it. Hello, um, my name is Mikko, I'm from the University of Helsinki. I have a question that in a way follows up the gentleman's question up front. Um, I know you guys mentioned that informal informal sector is very diverse. There's a huge heterogeneity of different types of workers within the informal sector. And I'm guessing that the, the skills and training required to enter in, into and to increase the productivity in these sectors is also very diverse, but it's probably undercounted within the general education and training systems which are targeted at the more at entry into the more formal economy. So how can we help prepare people um, to have the skills and the training required to do their jobs in the informal sector 
well and efficiently? And how do we develop educational and training systems for that while supporting their informality at the same time? Thank you. Thank you. That, that's very close to Sam's, to Sam's question, which is great. Thank you very much indeed. Marty, may I ask you to start, and then we'll go in the order of the speakers for just a couple of minutes each, I guess, at this point. Thanks for uh, the rich and varied mm. <laughs> questions and comments. Uh, livelihood and settlement. I think we need to, um, informal livelihood, and we need to understand the linkages there much better. Um, essentially, most urban informal workers work either in public space or they work in private homes. And so there's a lot of <laughs> um, productive activities happening in the informal settlements, and we need to understand those linkages, especially under conditions of relocation. And yes, women's responsibility under most <laughs> social norms for uh, unpaid um, care responsibilities does two things. One is it means that more women workers than men workers work in their own homes. A full 30% of women workers in India and Pakistan work from their homes. Um, and we have a program that Francie leads looking at the costs of the lack of childcare on the economic opportunities and productivity of women in the informal economy. On taxation, two things. One is many informal workers pay taxes. So there's a myth that they don't, and they would like benefits in return. So it can't just be taxation without incentives. The other is that taxation per se is only part of the definition of informal employment. So informal enterprises are defined as unincorporated enterprises. Nothing said about taxes. Although by implication, if you're incorporated, you may have to. When it comes to informal wage employment, it means that the employer is not making contributions to um, the social protection of the worker. And then you get into payroll and other kinds of taxes that employers are supposed to do. But if you remember the figures, only 2 to 9% of informal workers are employers. So much of that evasion of employer contributions is happening either by formal firms or by households that hire domestic workers. So it's a much more complicated thing uh, than we think, and it needs a lot of work. Um, on the government and informality and on um, other vested interests that have an interest in, in Paris' comment. Um, in the urban literature, which I now follow quite closely, there is a comp the concept of elite informality, which is when the state colludes with elite powerful interests to create exceptions to formal rules. And the classic case is the state creating informality uh, deals with the private real estate developers by privatizing um, public land, right? And there is a whole school of thought that the state is really uh, encouraging informality. In terms of other vested interests, one dimension of formalization that the informal workers would like is the right to be part of collective bargaining, tripartite negotiations, all of that. And I am reluctant to say it in, in uh, Finland, but the European trade unions are, were blocking the right of organizations of informal workers, including trade unions of informal workers, to have a direct voice in the ILO tripartite. So there are vested interests that don't want um, that. Um, and um, yeah, I'll leave it at there. There's there, it's a lot of rich questions. Oh, the skills training. Sorry, that's the last one. Um, you know, the notion was, and, and Richard Jolly was part of that early ILO uh, mission that found that people in the informal economy often acquire their skills informally outside the formal system. And this is true, and we have to recognize and certify and appreciate that. But we also know that informal workers are needing to adjust all the time even for informal jobs. So the construction industry gets mechanized, so manual lifting and carrying is no longer 
very, there aren't many jobs doing that. The women who used to do the lifting and carrying would like to be trained uh, as electricians and masons and tile layers and all the other kinds of trades within construction. And we, have, we are way behind on that. And I think we all need to get very creative about helping the informal workers keep pace even within the informal economy. And then, of course, to make the leaps. And I hate to say that in a country like India, which I know best, um, it's an IT-led growth. So even to get a job in a call center, you need English as a second language, right? So, I mean, it's not just skills, it's, it's the whole education system to prepare people for the formal jobs. Uh, because if it's not manufacturing-led, it's another whole uh, level of education and skills that are needed. Thank you, Marty. Imran. So, um, um, Marty's uh, sort of dealt with the with the with the bulk of them. I'll um, uh, I'll just say two things. I I think on on uh, per and um, Mika's questions about uh, and 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 uh, 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 Sam as well on uh, kind of questions of access. Uh, 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 Kind of access to resources and the state's incentives to, to 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 uh, to, uh, to keep uh, people informal. I, I, I mean, I, I I kind of do think that the the sort of policy response from state officials to to kind of all sorts of things that uh, that that would have quite a big impact on on basically improving incomes in the informal economy is the, the 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 kind of starting point really is to to get access to any resources you have to be you've uh, you've got to um, um, make yourself a formal enterprise and i think that that just loses the point that it's it's uh, the, that it's the wrong starting point just a uh, kind of second thought on the on the uh, 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 tax issue, and it's really uh, perhaps a question to Ravi and, and sort of building on Santiago's point. It seems to me what VAT does and what the uh, VAT threshold does is is to kind of uh, uh, regulate not who, not w whether the firm's paying VAT or not, but it it kind of really regulates whether the firm. Um, has the, the the kind of legal power fully to pass on the incidence of of the tax to the final consumer or not? So if you if you're in the formal sector and you in, you you uh, kind of above the threshold, the law saying you uh, you can fully pass on the incidence of the VAT to the final consumer. If you uh, below the threshold, you paying the tax up front, and the kind of extent to which you can Pass, pass on the incidence is going to depend on what the nature of that market is. And it seems to me uh, informal people often operate in kind of highly com uh, com 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 competitive markets. So the impact might really be to, to, to rather than evade the tax, it's sort of forcing you to pay the tax and, and, and not, not sort of pass the incidents on. Thanks. Ravi, would you come in there? Thank yeah, you. Sure. No, I, I, no, I think the, uh, the, the VAT point is, is very well taken, of course, uh, very clearly. I mean, what we were trying to do was not in some sense to give a story to an analysis of the VAT, but in some sense, a structure, any tax structure which has a threshold uh, below which certain things happen and above which certain other things happen. Ravi, and would you? Uh, uh, below which there's a certain regime and above which there's another a different regime. And what incentives does that give enterprises to sort themselves out into this side or that side, et cetera? And, but the, the point is very well taken, and indeed this is in some of your work, Imran, that, that in fact the, the informal sector as, as, as defined in this way uh, does, does not then have the capacity to pass on, as you say, to claim those credits in the VAT. So, and and that, that leads to the segmentation. So, so maybe I, I, I could have done, said everything without using the word VAT. <laughs> Just think about it. The, the basic point was that these tax regimes lead to this uh, partitioning 
of the of, of the population uh, in this in this way. And then your your point about informal uh, about the about the labor regulation, and that's the sort of point I was trying to make towards the end, which is a one uh, which is actually what we do in our in our in, it's a, it's a theory paper where we now look at if you like two tax regimes, okay. One with this threshold, one with that threshold. And you can think of a labor regulation as being an implicit tax regime where if you hire more than 10 workers, then you have to do registration, et cetera, and there's certain costs are imposed uh, on, on the firm. It's just a different, it's a different tax regime, if you like, uh, quote unquote. Yeah? Uh, and then that's the question. If you have two regulatory regimes, the firm has to respond to both in some way. And how do we think about that? How do we think about that? And I think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting analytical question for economists to be, uh, for technical economists to be thinking about. But it's also an interesting question for policymakers to be thinking about. If change in this regime affects incentives to locate yourself vis-a-vis -vis this regime, and the whole point is that in the policy context, it's the labor ministry which fixes the labor regulation side of the story, and it's the, uh, it's the Ministry of Finance which fixes the tax side of the story in a, in a very uncoordinated way. Because, of course, they haven't thought of it. They think of this as being the tax problem and this as being the informality regulation problem. And I think it's our task to bring that. Uh, so that was really the point that I was, that I was making there. On the, on the uh, hiding of international hiding, and the, again, a very, very good point. Um, uh, our story would go through. It's, it's a hide and seek story. It's not a where the hiding and seeking take place. But if the moment international hide and seek becomes available, then the costs and benefits of hiding and seeking will change, and that will then change the, the, uh, the, ba the boundaries of those different categories. So that's a, uh, that's a, that's a very, very good point. I think those are the ones that I... There were two outstanding hands from the early question, and I'll allow you the last questions, Richard, and we need them to be brief. So there was you first, and then you. Um, first to the side, please. Put, okay. Hi, then, my name is... And then is... we'll come in within time. That clock's a little a little fast. Okay. My name is uh, Beatriz Muriel. I am from Bolivia, from the NSF Foundation. I'm talking because 75% uh, of, uh, of uh, workers in my country, as I, I saw, uh, um, was uh, established that were uh, informal. But I think that it is um, logic to think that with the... Informality is low. It's logic to think that the formal sector can absorb uh, the informality uh, sector or the informality, uh, the formal workers. But in the case of Bolivia, I think it's, it is very, very complex. But Actually, it won't be complex and long, right? It will be complex and very, very, very brief. Sorry to do that to you. So I think we need to think in two, two other things. The benefit and cost, because many, um, I think that many informal workers in Bolivia prefer to be informal, because the costs sometimes are very high and the benefits are not low. And this also, I think it is related with uh, the quality of institution. But it is not only to have the, the, some rights, for instance, social protection, but the quality of social protection and so on. So you have to think not properly to reduce inform informality, but um, uh, improving uh, formal rules and improving the quality of institutions. Thank you for that comment very much. And yours? Thank you. I'm Evivan Stolund here from Finland. I am an independent researcher, so I guess I account to, to the informal e e economy. And... Uh, I was very, very pleased with all your uh, presentations, also the introduction of, of Diego, because I am struggling with the same questions in a post-industrial society. It's not as large, but it's just as important, important for the future. And I have been, well, I've been focusing on the status of artists and work in civil society. And... Um, then I was very, very pleased to see that you have this law program where you will look at what are the obstacles posed by law. And you mentioned also the harassment that people face by legal, legal system that does not uh, recognize the work. And to cut a long short story short, uh, when I have been contemplating these questions, I have come to the conclusion that a basic income would be a good way of, of uh, correcting the, the injustices in the system. And I'm curious to know if you have been thinking of these questions. 
And a final question or comment from Sir Richard. Thank you. I'd like to ask each of the panel members in terms of what next, where would they like to see the informal sector concept go? If I'm allowed one comment, when I shave in the morning, I realize that's informal sector activity. Everything one does by way of care of oneself or health protection at home in another sense is, uh, so I see the informal sector everywhere. How much of it, these activities would gain from this sort of informal sector analysis? Thank you. Shall we start with Ravi this time and move this way? And, and I think there were two comments as much as anything and then a question. So of course, uh, uh, there are national accounts type issues in this, in, in, in uh, Richard Shaving and so on. I mean, Pigou very famously uh, said that if he married his housekeeper, uh, national income would go down. It was his, uh, and that's precisely that it would then become from paid work, would become unpaid work. And the way that we measure national yeah. accounts, it would precisely be. Uh, so uh, the whole issue of measuring uh, unpaid for work, so to speak, is a, is a very big and a very old uh, issue. I'm not en entirely sure that, that these programs that we're involved with are addressing themselves to that directly. Uh, although, of course, in terms of childcare and so on, there are, there are programs in terms of addressing those issues, so to speak. But not, not I don't think, I may be wrong, in, in terms of technical issues of, of measuring that and bringing that into a measure of the informal economy. But I think that's a very good suggestion. Perhaps mm -hmm. we should be thinking about that in terms of our programs in WeGos. Thank you. I think that's correct that WeGos focuses very strictly on paid work, whether it's care work or not care work. We're try, trying to not dodge that line, although it comes very much, in, I guess, more in the social protection program than anywhere. Imran. So I'll uh, just uh, all that I can do is to is to is to basically respond to Richard's challenge. <coughs> uh, for me, I, I I think the last uh, the the last twenty years has brought an enormous amount of or, or some amount of clarity to how we uh, uh, of, to to what we 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 mean by the informal economy. Uh, it's brought a l lot more clarity to uh, uh, to who's inside the informal economy and, and uh, who's not, to what parts of our activities we sort of count as informal and which which part we don't. So I think Richard's example is uh, kind of clearly unpaid work rather than rather than work in the informal economy. But the sort of concept still remains. Uh, sort of quite clear and quite quite vague. So I, I'd I'd like to think if we uh, if we were all here at the 60th uh, sort of <laughs> conference of why uh, that that uh, that would be a, would, that, that that would be a lot clearer. Well, <laughs> touche. Great, Marty Ben, for your last comment. <laughs> Um, two, just two or three. One is the concept of informality. I think we're a lot clearer than I'm, my colleagues are allowing. Um, and it is a second best concept. It's, we need something to um, show a spotlight on the fact that what we call formal employment is a very sh small share of employment today. And then, yes, we do need to disaggregate it for policy and analytic and other purposes. In terms of formalization, um, if you ask the workers, and, and uh, Imran alluded to it, they're not trying to hide. What they would like is visibility. <laughs> They'd like voice. <laughs> they would like legal identity. They would like protection. They're not trying. This is the working poor and the informal. They're not trying to hide. They actually want visibility and voice. And then in terms of cost benefit analysis, I think we have, it's like taxation, we have to go a lot further. Uh, we've done a lot of empirical work on the costs of informality um, and what the workers would like as benefits of formality and what formality would mean to them. So I think there's a, a much, um, there's a rich agenda for further analysis <coughs> of the costs and benefits. 
And then, yes, in the post-industrial societies, we're working very closely with European statistical community to get measures of informality in the European community. They're very receptive. Um, and I think we will, we're moving towards having, you know, sort of a global concept where we can do global um, definitions. So stay tuned. Uh, we're, we're hard on work on many frontiers, and we appreciate your attendance today. Yeah. Thank you.